Turn with me, please, in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, looking at the second of the seven churches in the book of the Revelation. Revelation chapter 2 this morning, looking at uh, verses 8 through 11, the church at Smyrna. Again, we want to remind ourselves, since it's been several weeks since we've been here in this passage, that the book of the Revelation is a revelation of Christ. That is its primary point. It reveals to us the glory of Christ, the work of Christ, the authority of Jesus Christ, the plan of Christ. This is all revealed to us in the book of the Revelation. We read that this book is for His servants, as the opening verses of Revelation says, that it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God the Father gave to Him to show to His servants the things that must soon take place. So this is a book for believers. It is for those who are already born again servants of Jesus Christ. And it's written so that we might anticipate correctly the future to show his servants the things that must soon take place so that we can anticipate correctly what is happening. If I were to give you a statement that would summarize what's happening in the world today, it would be this. What is happening in the world today is God bringing everything under the feet of Jesus Christ. For when Jesus ascended on high, the Father said to him, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. That's what God has been doing ever since the ascension of Jesus Christ. How he is bringing everything under the feet of Jesus. And ultimately, everything will be under the feet of Jesus. If you've read the book of the Revelation, you know that's where it ends. Every knee bowing at the feet of Jesus. Every tongue confessing, Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what God is at work in the world doing today. He's bringing everything to the feet of Jesus. And now he does that in two ways. He does that through the work of salvation, and he does it through the work of judgment. He is bringing people today to the feet of Jesus, finding him as Savior and Lord. And ultimately, he will bring everyone who is not a believer to the feet of Jesus to confess that he is Lord. The wonder of wonders is that we get to confess him as Lord and Savior because we have put our trust in him. And so as we go through the book of the Revelation, we see, first of all, in chapter 1, the revelation of Christ in his ascended glory. Christ in his ascended glory, eyes like a flame of fire, feet like burning bronze, all speaking of wisdom, of authority, of judgment and justice. And then we come to chapter 2, and we have the revelation of Christ to the churches. And I would remind you that, first of all, we need to answer the question, what is revealed? The glory of Christ. That's what's revealed in this book, the glory of Jesus Christ. Secondly, uh, to whom is he revealed? To his servants, to believers. Now, in Revelation 2 and 3, we see the letters to the seven churches, churches that were actual, literal congregations in Asia Minor in 96 AD as John was penning this book. These were real churches. They were literal churches. They were actual churches. And these letters are to these individual churches, but they are more than that because you notice at the end of each of the seven letters to the seven churches, we read this statement. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church as. It doesn't say, hey, just you guys in Smyrna, listen up to this. No. It says, he that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to all of the churches. So if you have ears to hear, that is if you're a believer, and your ears have been opened to the Word of God, and you can hear His truth, as Jesus said, my sheep, say it with me, hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. So if you have ears to hear, you're a believer, then hear what the Spirit is saying to all of the churches. 
So while it is a specific letter to a specific church at a specific time, it also has truth for all of God's people for all time. And that's what we mine from it. The eternal truth that is for all of the churches for all the time. I know that there are those who would like to make the seven churches represent seven ages of the church, from the apostolic church to uh, the church under Constantine to the church in the Middle Ages, but I reject that. Uh, I reject it for two reasons. One, uh, it, it localizes the messages to a certain time period, which really doesn't make sense according to what it says at the end of each of the letters. If you've got ears to hear, listen to what the Spirit's saying to all the churches. And secondly, it is only the Western church that is in view in that interpretation. What about the church in Africa that has been there since the first century? What about the church in India? What about the church in China? What about the church in Asia? You see, it ignores all of that. It only looks at the Western church and the Reformation instead of looking at the church of Jesus Christ worldwide. So I don't hold with the idea of the ages or stages of the church interpretation. I think that I think that goes directly contrary to what is being stated here as to its whole purpose. It's to a literal church at a literal place with a message that is for all churches all the time. And so we come to the second church. Now, in the first church that we looked at uh, four weeks ago, the church at Ephesus, we saw that there were five things that Christ dealt with in the church at Ephesus. And these five things are the five things that are dealt with in all of the other churches. Now, some of them are only dealing with one, like Smyrna today. Some of them deal with all five. Some of them deal with two or three or four. But these are the five things that are dealt with in all of the churches. First of all, work. Jesus says, I know your deeds. I know what you're doing. What we do matters to Christ. I know what you're doing. What we do matters. First of all, work. Secondly, truth. Holding on to the true message of the scriptures. Thirdly, love. Love for God and one another. Jesus said, the greatest of all the commandments is this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. So we have work, we have truth, we have love, we have purity. Walking in purity in the midst of an evil and adulterous generation. And then lastly, suffering. These five areas are dealt with repeatedly in these seven churches. And I find it fascinating to think about the fact that these are the things that Jesus wants us as his people to understand that he knows and that we need to know. Work. What we do for him. Truth what we believe about him. Purity, how we reflect him. Love, how we respond to him. And suffering, because we live in a fallen world and it's not going to be easy. Now to the church in Smyrna, this second church, Jesus has but a few things to say, but they are extremely significant. Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last. Now, we could spend a whole message right there. You say, why? Because we see here that this is the word of God. It's the word of Christ. It is accurate. It is preserved. It is the words of him who has who is the first and the last. God has preserved His Word for us. Nothing has been added to it, nothing taken from it. This is the Word of the living God. These are the words of Jesus. You say, well, I wonder what God thinks about... Here are the words of Jesus. Well, I wonder what God would say about... He's already said it. These are the words of the first and the last. Do you see that? These are the words of Him who is the first 
and the last. Aren't you glad that God is a communicating God? Now, I know God hasn't said everything we want him to say. He hasn't given us all the information we would like to have. But he's given us all the information we need to have. He is a God who speaks. That's the first thing we learn about him in the book of Genesis. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. This one who speaks, speaks with power. This one who speaks, speaks with authority. This one who speaks, speaks with accuracy. He is the God who speaks. I'm so thankful that we have the word of God. And that God is a speaking God. He doesn't leave us to wonder about the things we need to know. He's given it to us. These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions or suffering and your poverty. Yet, you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you. Do you see that emphasis again? I tell you. This is Jesus speaking. This is the first and the last, the one who speaks with absolute authority. The one who says, let there be and there is. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death. And I will give you the crown of life. Do you see what he says in verse 9? I know. In verse 10, I tell you. And then he says... I will give you. Christ is in control here. He's in absolute control. And he's letting the church at Smyrna know that suffering is their stewardship. He's letting the church at Smyrna know that suffering is their stewardship. Let that sink in. This is not a consequence of their disobedience. This is not a chastisement for their rebellion. This is a stewardship entrusted to them by Christ. It is not a stewardship we volunteer for. It is not one any of us Desire In all of the prayer meetings I have been at, I have never yet heard anyone plead with God for the opportunity to suffer more. It is usually the exact opposite, is it not? And we have every right to ask God to remove, reduce, or relieve our suffering. But we also have to understand that there are times in our lives where it is very clear that God is assigned to us a stewardship called suffering. It is allotted to God's people for holy purposes. I know, Jesus says, I know your afflictions, your suffering, that is, your poverty. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. He doesn't say, you know, if you prayed harder, you wouldn't have to suffer. He didn't say that. Well, if you just walked in obedience, it'd be easier. No, he didn't say that. He said, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put you, some of you, in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death. And I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all. Oh, I love that statement. Will not be hurt at all by the second death. 
Do not be afraid of the first death. You won't be touched by the second. See, there are two births and there are two deaths. There is the physical birth and there is the physical death. And then there is a spiritual birth, born again. And there is a second death, which is ultimate separation from God in the lake of fire. An eternal and spiritual death. Now, he tells us here, to those who have been born twice, that they need not fear either the first or the second death. For those who have not been born twice, there is nothing but fear. Because both the first and the second death will be their portion. He's putting things in eternal perspective. That is so necessary and yet so counterintuitive to us. We are by nature people of the immediate. Why me? Why this? Why now? Anybody there? <laughs> Anybody ask those questions? Why me? Why this? Why now? This is such a bad time for this to be happening. This is such an inopportune time, such an inappropriate time. It would be much better if it was later, definitely, much later, preferably. But why this? Why me? And why now? Well, Jesus lets us know, and I think we need to mine this truth for ourselves this morning, that Christ is telling the church that they are obtaining from him a stewardship of suffering which nothing will remove. You will. The devil will. And I will. You will, the devil will, and I will. You will suffer persecution 10 days. The devil will put some of you in prison. And I will give you the crown of life. Don't miss all three of those realities. You see, the first thing we notice here is the revelation of Christ. He's the first and the last. He's in charge. You see, it's natural for us when trouble comes our way to, to think, oh, no, everything's out of control. Is God even here? Is he at work? Does he know what's happening? Listen, Jesus says, I know. That's so comforting. I know. But it's more comforting that he says, I'm the first and the last. Because I may know something about your suffering, but I can't do anything about it. But he's the first and the last, and that's a statement of sovereignty. I am the one that begins everything, and I am the one that brings it all to its conclusion. I am the first, and I am the last. I am outside of time, but I'm involved in it, and I'm in charge. And I know your suffering. I know your affliction. The church at Smyrna was a place of persecution for believers. It was a place of a temple to Caesar. It was a place of hardship for believers where society expected them to offer incense to the gods. They wouldn't do it. So many of them lost their businesses because it was considered unpatriotic not to attend the pagan temples and their feasts. But these believers in Smyrna were people who believed that Jesus was Lord and they couldn't go along with what was accepted practice in society. And as a result of that, they were persecuted. They lost their reputation. They were slandered by Jews as well as pagans. It seemed that everybody was their enemy. Nobody was on their side. Nobody would take up for them. Well, that's not true. Jesus took up for them. But both Jew and pagan slandered them. They lost their reputation. They lost their homes. They lost their businesses. But Jesus said, you will not lose your reward. You see, Jesus is constantly putting us into an eternal perspective. And that's the one thing the world will never do for you. The world may slander you or they may praise you, but they will never give you an eternal perspective. Only Jesus Christ does that. And that's what we need, especially when we're suffering. We need to set this thing in the light of eternity. Jesus is the first and the last. Let's not forget that. It always begins with Jesus. These letters to the seven churches always begin with Jesus. And the thing about Jesus that that church needs to know, and when you're in suffering, brother or sister, you need to know Jesus is in control. 
This did not happen because he was sleeping. This suffering did not come because he doesn't care. This suffering didn't happen because he wasn't aware of it. He knows. That's what he says. I know. I am the first and the last. I know. Isn't that comforting? Can't you hang on to that in the midst of all the confusion? In the midst of all the things we don't know, we do know this. He's the first and the last, and he knows your suffering, your affliction, the slander of those who hate you. He knows. He's in control. That's why he says, I am the first and the last. Second thing he says is, I'm the one who died. Isn't it wonderful also to know that not only is Jesus sovereign, but he's the sovereign sufferer. As God, he knows all things, but as man, he's been there. He's suffered. He knows. He knows because he's God, and God knows everything. But he knows in a unique way because he's the one who died. And what is the most that suffering can do to us but kill us? But Jesus said, do not fear him who can kill the body, and after that can do no more. Rather, I say to you, fear him who after he has killed the body can destroy both soul and body in hell. I tell you, fear God. You see, Jesus is the one who died. He'll go with you just as far as it takes, and he'll never leave you nor forsake you. And death holds no bonds to him. He's the first and the last. He's the one who died. And don't forget the third declaration, I am the one who came to life again. You see, he keeps putting it in eternal perspective. God is sovereign in your suffering. He knows. He's in charge. And he has a blessing waiting. Do you see what it says here? He says, you will suffer. But it's a limited time, 10 days. Now, some Bible scholars think that means the days of the 10 emperors from Titus, Vespasian, Domitian, and on through until Constantine. Maybe. Some think it just means 10 days of intense suffering, very literally. May very well mean that. Whichever it means, now hear me, whichever it means, it's definite and limited. That much we know, right? It's definite, 10 days, and it's limited, not 11. The suffering that comes into our lives is definite. He doesn't say, well, I don't know how long this is going to last, but uh, you know, <laughs> I'm so glad. God never says things like that. It's very definite, and it's limited, 10 days. Put that in the light of eternity. Now, those 10 days may be the worst 10 days you've ever had in your life, but there's still only 10. It's limited. And Jesus said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Do not live your life anxious and fearful. I am the first and the last. I'm in charge. I'm your fellow suffering. Did you notice how Revelation began? I'm your companion in suffering, John said. The apostle that wrote this said, I'm your companion in suffering. But how much more wonderful is it to know that Jesus is our companion in suffering? And you can never suffer alone. In all their afflictions, it tells us in the Psalms, he was afflicted. You never suffer alone. Your suffering is sovereignly appointed, it's limited in duration, and it is not to cause anxiety or fear. You know, as you read the book of the Revelation, some people don't like to read it because they oh, it's just all so scary. Well, frankly, it's a lot of fearful stuff there, but not if you put it in the light of eternity. Where are you going to end up, Revelation 20 or 21? If you're going to end up in Revelation chapter 20, you better fear because that's the great white throne judgment, the destruction of the heavens and the earth. But if you're a believer, your end is Revelation 21, and I saw a new heavens and a new earth. 
For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be their God and be with them. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away, and he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Lay hold of the truth of Jesus, the first and the last, the sovereign Savior, the one who died, the suffering Savior, the one who lives again, the rescuing Savior. And do not fear the suffering. Do not fear it. It's a stewardship. It's an opportunity to grow your faith and to show a watching world that your faith does not rest on circumstances, but on a risen Christ. And he gets all the glory. Lord, we thank you for this letter to the church at Smyrna. And though we've only just scratched the surface of it, we're so thankful for the truths that are so obviously declared there that you are sovereign, the first and the last. You are aware, you know. You are with us, and you will reward us. We may lose our reputations. We may lose our possessions. We may even lose this earthly life, but you have promised we would not lose our reward if we follow you. So give us the grace, we pray, Lord Jesus, from your throne of grace to walk without fear into the future that you have ordained for us. Help us to live today in the light of eternity. And we pray this for your glory in your name. And all God's people said.